Now it's time for uh, today's perspective here on France 24. And my guest today grew up in a mining community in the north of Zimbabwe. She watched as she saw uh, some of her friends forced into child marriages and early motherhood, whilst others became sick with HIV. She though decided to make a stand, a name for a different life. So seven years ago, Beatrice Savady started a women's group for Zimbabweans. It's called uh, Roots Africa. It's aimed to push for stronger laws to protect women trapped uh, with abusers from a surge in violence and from HIV infections. And she joins us now as part of our special coverage today to mark the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Thanks very much for joining us on the programme today. Um, let's start at the beginning, at the beginning of your life, if you like. I mean, tell me what your life um, was growing up and the problems that you saw around you. Thank you very much for having me on the programme. I uh, grew up in a farming and mining community called Bindura, and I grew up in a poor family where I had at some point to do gold panning for survival to support uh, the income that my family wanted to raise us. I also at some point became a street vendor, you know, selling vegetables in our community uh, to be able to support my family as well. So. The Bindura community is uh, very much resource endowed. There are a lot of minerals. There are a lot of, there's a lot of farming, rich farming land. But the wealth that's in that uh, town or that province where I come from um, is in the hands of the few. So growing up, I saw those inequalities and injustice that was happening in my community. And because I grew up in a poor family, uh, when I started my period, my mother had to int introduce me to using old clothes um, because she could not afford sanitary towels. And within the home, I, you know, family were three girls, one boy. And my father would tell my brother, who is um, two years older than me, to beat us up if we misbehave. So I experienced violence growing up within the home. And I also saw boy-child preference when we were growing up within the home. Then I, I was a very straight um, A student uh, in high school. And I remember at some point I became the junior parliament of the constituents that I come from, that um, Bindura South constituency. And one of the politicians from the, um, the, the community where I come from um, abused me. Um, she, he made advances on me. Um, so when I realized later on, at that point, I didn't have a name for it, but I felt that I did not like what had happened to me. And you weren't um, accepted just to accept that kind of thing as normal then? There is normalization of violence where we have uh, traditional norms and practices such as child marriage that happen within our communities, such as um, we call it Chiramu, where um, your your uncle, like your, your aunt's husband, can actually, um, you know, play with you, touch you, and it's regarded as part of our culture. So there is some normalization of violence such that... Um, some incidences like what that politician tried to do to me, it may not be seen as um, something that can actually be reported and uh, somebody get persecuted. So it depends on the gravity of the sexual violation that you face. So if you have faced rape, then you can get attention. But if somebody touches you, if somebody catch calls, it can be seen as something that's normal because we have normalised violence. Uh, and you decided, though, our, that that wasn't good enough culture. and you wanted to try and do something about it, didn't you? Yes, indeed. I did. Like I said, I didn't have a name for it then when I was younger. But then when I grew, grew older, seeing my friends who also got violated by people uh, in decision making spaces, people who have power, and this went unchecked, these people were not reported. I have friends who actually died of HIV. I had friends who were married off when they were younger, and they were, the people who married them were not even arrested. So I knew I needed to do something about it. And I also grew up like Mashonal and Central is a province where there's so a lot of political violence that happens. And I knew in a country where there's coordinated repression that they needed 
um, it, it needed a few individuals or more individuals actually who step forward and say, I want to hold my government to account. I want my uh, government to uphold human rights. And I decided to be one of those people because of what experience and what I saw my friends going through. And you did, uh, I mean, you've had a number of successes, haven't you? Um, notably, uh, a court judgment, uh, which you, you helped with, which has led to the ban of child marriage in Zimbabwe. Also, you've been pushing now for the legalisation mm -hmm. of abortion there as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. So th some of the work that we have done um, to hold the government to account is around menstrual health and ending period poverty. So in 2012, we, through the advocacy work that I did together with other organizations and my colleagues uh, at Roots Africa, we managed to get the government to reduce the tax that charged on sanitary towels, the 12%, 15% tax that was being charged on sanitary towels. And we also in 2014 lodged a constitutional court case to uh, have the government ban child marriage in Zimbabwe, and we managed to get um, through this groundbreaking uh, constitutional court to, get, to get the government to ban child marriages as of 20 January 2016. And currently, we are also, because of the work that we do around child marriage, we see a lot of women who are desperate to have a right to exercise, you know, their choice in terms of uh, family planning. One of the some of the work that we are doing is around uh, the Termination of Pregnancy Act in Zimbabwe, which is very restrictive in terms of how many women, what um, conditions we, under which women can actually access uh, termination of pregnancy. Uh, do you th how do you think the, what you've done and what you've been able to achieve um, has, do you think it's changed very much? Do you think it's changed very much in the actual minds of men around you and, and men in power as well? There is a lot that still needs to be done. Indeed, the constitutional court case uh, it was groundbreaking and was very influential in terms of having communities, having national dialogue around, OK, this is not OK, we need to do something about it. But where we're still lacking is that there is little resourcing of policies and laws in our country that um, sup support you know, equality, gender equality, laws that deter people from perpetrating uh, gender-based violence against women. For example, we have the Domestic Violence Act, but you find that our police officers are poorly resourced. So, for example, during this lockdown period, we had a, an escalation of the cases of gender-based violence, and we would support um, survivors of violence to go to the police stations to get recourse. But the police officers were saying they didn't have enough PPE, so they could not even take in the perpetrators of sexual violence, even though the survivors had reported these cases. So you see that because we have tried to push as advocacy organizations, as Roots Africa, but as long as there is no resourcing of such policies, as, no, as long as the, no, our government actually is a signatory to a lot of regional and international instruments, uh, the SADC gender protocol, the Maputo plan of action, and or even the domestic violence act that's um, their domestic but you find that they are poorly resourced. So much as we have done a lot of work to promote gender equality, to make sure that there is no violence, there is elimination of violence against women, there is little resourcing in terms of then the justice system and enabling uh, survivors to be able to access the justice system. Beatrice, great to talk to you uh, on the programme today. Beatrice Savady joining us there from uh, Zimbabwe, from Roots Africa. Thanks very much. The main headlines on Live from Paris then. Non-essential shops across Paris. France are preparing today for a big reopening this weekend after the French president announced a three-stage end to the country's lockdown. And America is back, says Joe Biden, as he unveils the first of his team to take over the reins of the US from January. Biden promising the US will no longer reject its allies as he turned the page on Donald Trump's America First mantra.